I'm going to read from the book of Ephesians, um, Ephesians 6. And it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Morning, everybody. I'll start now. Give me two seconds. I don't know how you tall oaks use a short thing, eh? <laughs> yeah, morning, everybody. Um, my name is Dennis John Jacobs. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to share with you this morning. If you want to know why I've got a jacket on on spring day, it's because uh, my wife and I recently had a baby 20 years ago, and I'm still carrying the, the weight, you know, <laughs> so it's too hard. But <laughs> anyway, it is a privilege for me to be here. I don't know if you can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, you know, as we were singing this morning. And the Holy Spirit is with us because we're going to speak about Jesus. As soon as we raise up the name of Jesus, as soon as we speak about Jesus, the Holy Spirit moves. And so we ask that the Holy Spirit would move. If it's your first time here, or maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus as uh, your Lord and Savior, I just want to ask that you would open your heart today because he's got something to tell you. Uh, he's got a message for all of us. So my brother Christopher died uh, in 1988. He was killed by a drunk driver. And uh, it was traumatic. In fact, we didn't have the words to describe how we felt. We couldn't talk to each other about it. And I remember a few years later, my sister, um, I was speaking to my sister about Christopher, our brother. Uh, my sister's name is Bonnie, and she was quite sad because she had found some photos. And in the photos, it was me and Christopher. I had my arm around him, and I was hugging him. Um, and that was a, a picture that spoke of this intimate relationship that we had. There was a bond. And Bonnie didn't have a picture like that. A few years later, I'd moved to Cape Town, and I was unpacking my boxes, and one of the boxes that I found uh, was a book that was obviously Christopher's. And as I paged through that book, I came to the, the last page, and I saw that he had doodled on that page. And uh, one of the doodles was a little heart, there's a slide for it, uh, and some, some letters on, on the side. Uh, that, that doodle of the heart he had written underneath there, Christopher and Sally. Sally was a girl that he had taken a shine to. I think if you knew my brother Christopher, he wouldn't have said that he liked her. He would have told you that he, he loved her because he lived like that. Um, but then on the, on the other side, I saw this doodle, and uh, it intrigued me because I was like, why did he write those letters? And as I started looking at those letters, I realized that there was a pattern there. And as I looked at the pattern, I realized you know, that as I took letters out, I could take a letter and make a word. And as I took a word out, I found a sentence. And in that sentence, as I read it, I became amazed because he had hidden a message in there specifically for my sister Bonnie. And what he had written was, tell Bonnie I love her. In those letters... And, you know, as I told Bonnie that story, she was, she was comforted, she was amazed. I mean, we cried about that, uh, that hidden message that Christopher had given to her. You know, as I, as I thought about his life, his life was uh, ended abruptly. You know, there were so many things that were left unsaid, both from him and from us to him. And yet he had left that message for my sister, which gave her great comfort. As I've read the Bible over these many years, I've seen that same pattern that God comes to speak words of comfort to us, that he gives us messages, that he wrote messages to us thousands of years ago. And he tells us those messages and reveals those messages in the time that we need them the most. You know, words are powerful. Everything there was about words. 
And, and, the, and the Word of God, the Bible tells us that our words are powerful. Uh, it tells us in Proverbs that those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. That's how powerful our words are, that, that our life can be, can be ruined by what we speak. Matthew 12, 36, Jesus says, uh, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word spoken. I don't know what words you've spoken today, but Jesus is just telling us our words are powerful. He tells us that by our words, we'll be acquitted and by your words, you'll be condemned. Our words are powerful, but God's word is also powerful. And throughout the Bible, we're told how powerful God's words are. Uh, Jesus tells us that man must not, uh, we shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, that God's words are powerful. He tells us, uh, Isaiah says to us, that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God endures forever. Jesus actually tells us the same thing. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And Isaiah reminds us of how powerful God's words are. You know, as we speak these words this morning and that they are God's words, I want to remind you what Isaiah tells us. He says, my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Whatever God is speaking to us today through the scripture, through his word, those things are going to come true. His word will not return void. It's going to accomplish what he set it out to do. And yes, we see that God's word is powerful. You know, God's word is, uh, comforts us, it guides us, it's active. His word is alive. His word is transformative. It's strength, uh, it's, strength it's truth. His word is healing. His word is encouraging. It's instructive. It's eternal. His word endures forever. It's unchanging and it's everlasting. God's word is all of these things. God's word is powerful. And then Paul reminds us today as we read those scriptures that all that power comes to bear because we're in a spiritual battle and we need a weapon. And the weapon is the word of God. It is the Bible. I want to take a step back quickly and remind us of the battle that we are in. Over these last weeks, we've spoken about the spiritual warfare. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 16 to 11 what God wants us to do. He says in, those, in that scripture, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God that you can take your stand against the, evil, the devil's schemes. And he uses these words. You know, the word of God is always, uh, it's powerful because it's specific. He uses words that will speak to us specifically about things that he wants to speak to us specifically about. He says, be strong. You know, the world tells us to be strong in ourselves, that we need ourselves to be strong. It's all about ourselves, self-help and selfies. And he's saying to us, that is not the truth. The truth is that God is powerful. God is almighty. God is omnipotent. God is sovereign. God is the one. And so you don't stand in your own strength when you have trouble. You stand in the mighty power of God. God is powerful. He says, be strong in the Lord and his power. And then he says, put on the full armor of God. Not some of it, some day, but all of it, every day. I don't know if you know this, if you're a Christian, if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, you'll know that when you were born again, the devil didn't stop attacking you. In fact, sometimes uh, you became a shining light to him and he tries to do more than what he would have done before. You have to put on the full armor of God all day and every day. And then he says, why? So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. I don't know if you know that the devil has schemes in your life. That word schemes is is an important word because it's only used twice uh, in in the New Testament, and both of them, they speak of craftiness and deceit. The the devil doesn't come to us the way that Hollywood shows us the devil. It's not with with a a, a red guy with a black hood and, and, and horns on his head. He comes to us as an angel of light. He's deceitful, and he comes into our lives. Did you know that the devil has schemes in your life? The Bible says that the devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I want you to think about what the devil's doing in your life even at this time now. Because he came here to steal your hope and to steal your joy. He came to steal your faithfulness, your holiness, your money, your livelihood. He came to steal the relationships with your children. and with your, He came to steal your marriage. And he's not going to stop and he's, he's going to try and steal all of those things. He came to steal. He came to kill. He wants to kill you. He wants to kill your family. Because he knows what Jesus has deposited in you. The strength and the might and the power that you have because you are in Christ. And because of that, he knows the strength that is going through your family line to your children. And even if you don't see that in your children now, when you chose God, when you chose Jesus, you changed your family line. 
I put before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your family may be saved. You and your family. And the devil comes and he sees the giants that we are and he wants to kill us. Because it says that the devil, he, he, he roams around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. He's not there to just ankle tap you or to trip you up. The devil wants to devour you. I remember I had a friend um, and he had found these two hyena puppies. You might have heard the story before, but I'll tell it again. Um, and he had raised these two hyena puppies. And I keep doing this because they were about this big. And uh, when we went to see him, he had built an enclosure, and he said to us, you know, you can come into the enclosure and you can pet these puppies. And like everything inside of me was like, I don't want to pet Taina puppies. Eh? So I kind of stood back, you know. But one of my friends went in and she petted this puppy and, uh, and everything was fine. She came out, and I think she actually said to me, Dan, she's such a chicken. Eh? I was like, uh, I think hyenas can smell chicken. Eh? I think they're going to eat. I've seen what a hyena can do to a chicken. Anyway, I didn't pet that puppy eh? Um, and a few months later, uh, we got a call, and that guy had gone out into that enclosure, and one of the puppies had taken off his leg, and one had taken off his arm. Because what that guy had done is he had convinced himself that what he was petting and patting was a puppy. And in fact, what he was petting and patting was a monster. He was raising monsters in his own house. And so that's what we do with our sin, because the devil doesn't want us to see the puppies, the, the monster. He wants us to see the puppies. And so what have you let into your life? What are you petting and patting in your life? What have you let into your family? Thinking that you're just flirting with something. Maybe you're flirting with someone at work. Maybe you're flirting with an addiction. Maybe you're flirting with gambling. Maybe you're flirting with, uh, with, with pills. What are you flirting with? Because it, it isn't what it looks like. It's a monster, and he came to devour us. And you know, the devil's not taking a break, he's not taking a holiday, he's not taking a rest. He's after us, day after day, and Paul says, put on the full armor, put it on all day, always, take your stand. And so we have a weapon. God has not left us unarmed and useless. He's given us a weapon, and that weapon is the sword of the Spirit. And Paul writes to us, he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And again, he uses these words so specifically to tell us something, to give us a message. He says, take. This is a verb. I think Brett spoke about how it means to accept or receive, that we already have it, but we have to accept us. And a verb is an action word, so we have to do something. You have to take this Word of God. You have to take this uh, uh, weapon. Also, we have, to, we have to know how to use the weapon. A weapon's useless if you don't know how to use it. And he tells us that it's a sword, it's a weapon. The word that he uses, it's a, it's a Greek word, and it's makaira. And it's a specific sword. It's a short stabbing sword. It wasn't one of the long swords. It's a short stabbing sword because he wanted to speak to us about a, a, a close quarter attack that's going to happen in your life. That the devil's going to come up and he's going to be close and he's going to be personal. He tells us that the sword of the spirit is it's of the spirit. This is a spiritual weapon that's given to us by the Holy Spirit, because our war is not against flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual battle. The people that are pushing you down and trying to cut your legs out from under you, it's not those people that you're fighting against. It's not those people that are trying to get you down. You are in a spiritual battle, and so you need a spiritual weapon. And he tells us this is the Word of God. You don't need a theology lesson or a degree to know that. When Paul says, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It is your Bible. The weapon is your Bible. The weapon is my Bible. You know, uh, as I said, this is a, a short sword, Makaira, and it's for close and personal attacks because the devil gets close and he gets personal. The devil knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows what you like. He knows the things that you're willing to do to compromise your family, uh, your livelihood, your money. He knows what you're going to do. He knows the, the puppies that you're going to let into your family. And so he comes to you. The devil doesn't tempt you with what he tempts me with. He tempts you with what you allow him to. The things that you have opened your heart to, he comes in and he gives you those puppies. So that by the time you've got a monster, it's too late and he'll devour you. It's up close and it's personal. And the only way that you're going to defend yourself is if you take up the sword. He has schemes. He's crafty. He's deceitful. And I wonder today... Do you have a scheme? Do you have a plan? Do you have a strategy? Because the devil is attacking you. Whether, you. whether you accept it or not, there's things in your life that he's put in there. And God is saying to you today, he wants to open your eyes and open your heart and say, it's, it's not what it looks like. 
And I'm not going to be able to control this thing. Lord, would you, would you help me? And so we're told to take up the weapon. We have to open the Word of God. We have to read the Word of God. So I won't do a, a, a test now. We're going to do a test at the end. But I'll just ask you, you know, have you got your Bible with you? Okay, we'll pretend. Yes, we've got our Bible with us. So and I'm going to read from you. I read from the Bible for you. And I'm going to do this quickly. And so you've got to keep up because it is in the test afterwards. Let's read. You know, sometimes if somebody says, where should I start reading the Bible? Somebody will say, well, read the Gospels. It's the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's give that a go and see what God does. I'm going to read from Matthew 1, 1 to 10. You've got to keep up here. I'm going to do it quickly. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abram. Abram was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nason. Nason, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of, of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Are you keeping up? Eh? Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. She didn't even get a name there. There's a whole story. Go find that story. It's amazing. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers the time of the exile to Babylon. How's that feel? Are you full? Huh? Are you hungry and thirsty for God's word? You know, <laughs> before I was born again, uh, my mom, she used to give me a Bible at every occasion. My mother loved Jesus. If, you know, I'd, I'd take another two hours to tell you how much my, love, my mother loved Jesus. And uh, her, her, her heart's desire was that we would love Jesus like she loved Jesus. My heart's desire is that my children would love Jesus the way that I love Jesus. My heart's desire is that you would love Jesus the way that I love Jesus. But because she loved Jesus so much, uh, she loved the Word of God. She loved her Bible. Man, and she used to give me a Bible at every occasion. On her birthday, I got a Bible. On my dad's birthday, I got a Bible. On my child's birthday, I got a Bible. On my wife's birthday, I got a Bible. Sometimes the occasion was just I went to the shop and I found a Bible and I got a Bible. You know, and I had, so I had about 40 Bibles in my house when I was born again. All of them unopened, unread, useless, pointless. And I thought that's what they were, useless and pointless. Because I thought you'd have to be naive to read this. I don't know if you know some of the stories in this, in this book of ours. You know, there's a story of a man who walks on water. There's a story of a man who lives in a fish. There's a story of a donkey who talks. There's a story of a prophet who puts his underpants under a rock. There's a story of a prophet who has to lie on his side for hundreds of days uh, uh, to get forgiveness for Israel. These are, you know, they're crazy stories. And I thought they were crazy. Until something happened, I met Jesus, I was born again, I repented and gave my life to Jesus. And suddenly those little books started to speak to me. They started to shine. In the bookshelf, they were like, read me, read me. They spoke to me. That's how the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I don't know about you. And so I started. And you know, I had this friend, his name is Renato. I did invite him. He couldn't come today. And uh, I went to Renato. I saw that he loved his Bible. He had his Bible with him everywhere. And I went to him and I said, Renato... I want to read the Bible and love the Bible like you read the Bible and you love the Bible. And he, and he asked me a very like, peculiar question. And it actually comes from, from the Bible. Strangely enough, every time I asked Renato something, he told me something from the Bible. I'd often say, like, can't you tell me something else? But he'd bring it from the Bible. And he spoke, uh, uh, he, he, he reminded me of a scripture. It's Jesus who walks. Uh, there's a man that's been sitting there for 38 years and, and, he's, and he's sick. Uh, and he's begging. And Jesus, it says to us in John 5, 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? It's like a weird thing to ask a guy who's been sick for 38 years. But the thing is that Jesus isn't asking the guy that. He's, he's speaking to his heart. He's saying to him, what's in your heart? Are you sitting there looking sick so that you can beg? Or do you actually want to be healed? And Renato said something the same. He said to me, do you want to read this book? And you know the amazing thing about the Holy Spirit is that he put inside of me a small hunger so that I'd ask for a big hunger. And I had a small hunger and I said, Renato, I want to read this book. And he prayed for me. Let me tell you the prayer he prayed for me. You can write this down. It's going to take about three pages. He said, Lord, would you give this man a hunger and a thirst for your word? Amen. I was pretty unimpressed. Eh? He had been a Christian for a long time. And I was like, I'm going to have to teach this guy to pray. 
I thought nothing had happened. But, you know, as I look back, I see that that's what God has done because his word is true. And he says, you know, when Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. When you hunger and thirst for Jesus, he will fill you. And that's what he did. So as we read all those names, you might have read all those names and listened to all those names and thought, you know, I don't get that. And in fact, if somebody had never read the Bible and you said, read Matthew 1 to 10, they'd probably turn around and go after like Matthew 5 saying, this is a list of weird names. Never heard these names. It's quite weird because I actually met a guy the other day called Jehoshaphat and I was like, I know where your name comes from. So let's try something else. We'll read the word of God. Let's go to 2 Kings 22 and we'll read about this little boy named Josiah. And, and, and it tells us, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he, re- and he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adia, of Bosketh. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in all the way of David and his father, and he turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So here you've got this little boy, he's eight years old. It's an amazing story. And it tells us this thing about him. It says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Imagine, imagine you, you die and you go to heaven and you're standing there in front of God and it's judgment day. And Jesus is standing next to you and he says, Father, this is Dennis. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. What a blessing that is. That's what he wants us to do, what is right in the sight of the Lord. But it tells us this about Josiah because it wants to tell us that he's different from the guys who came before him. And Josiah is different because his father and his grandfather are two of the most evil kings that have ever reigned. They are evil. His, his grandfather offers his own child up for child sacrifice. He burns him in a fire to, to, to a, a, an idol. He, he practices sorcery and he practices witchcraft. If you ever want to know what God thinks about witchcraft, about sorcery, about, about divination... You can read it in Deuteronomy 18.10, and he says, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination, sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, who is a medium or spiritist, who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. What they were doing was detestable to the Lord, and that word detestable means he hates it and he abhors it. There's things that are happening in our country today in, in, in different places, witchcraft, consulting the dead. And God says, I just want to remind you again today that these things are detestable. I hate them. And this is what he speaks. So his, his grandfather was this evil guy. His father was even worse. It tells us about his grandfather uh, in 2 Kings uh, 2.16. It says, he shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. It was so bad. People were dying. There were so many people dying. Jerusalem's a big place, but there was blood all over. These were crazy times and evil people. And his father was worse. And the, the two were the same. And then it says about them this thing. It says, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. But Josiah, he did that which was right in the sight of of the Lord. And so Josiah, when he's 18, he decides he's going to go and clear the temple out and he's going to restore it to what it was. And in the temple, there's a high priest, and the high priest, as they're clearing the temple, he finds under all the filth and the stuff that they've put in God's temple, he finds what? He finds a book. And what is that book? That book is the book of the law, that book is the Bible. And he reads that book and he gives the book to, to Josiah's scribe, his secretary, and he says, Read this. He reads it. You know that guy, he's, he's convinced, he's convicted. Those words speak to him. And then he says, I've got to show this to the king. So he takes it to the king and he reads it to the king. And, and, and in reading it to the king, everything changes. It says that he's moved, he's, he, he tears his clothes. He's so moved by these words because what he reads is the book of the law, and the book of the law is Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy tells him that these things are detestable to the Lord. And in fact, as you read further on, it says that God is going to destroy them because of what they've done. And so he reads of this coming destruction, and so he, he, these, these words change everything, and it changes the trajectory of, of, of his reign over those people. It changes everything. And, and so he decides he's going to read this Bible to everyone. He's going to read the book to everyone. It tells us in 2 Kings chapter 23, the king sent and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And, and the king went up into the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Ju- Jerusalem with him. And the priests and the prophets and the people, both small and great, 
He's telling us, like, everyone came, and he read to them. Everyone came, and they got to hear God's word. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord, and everything changed. You know, their destruction wasn't coming because they didn't have God's word. Their destruction was coming because they didn't read God's word. Their destruction was coming because God's word was hidden under the filth. That book was hidden. And I just want to ask you today, where's that book now? Where's the book in your life now? What have you hidden that book under? Are you reading the Bible? The Bible isn't something that we read as a side project, as something that the Bible is the truth. It's God's word. It's God's message. It tells you what he wants from you. It tells you what he's doing from you. It tells you where you're going. But where have you hidden that book today? And sometimes that book is hidden under so many things in our life. Maybe you've hidden it under laziness or distraction. I don't know what the excuse is that you have for not reading the Bible, but I just want to tell you, and I'll say it just to annoy you, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's called laziness and distraction. Maybe you've hidden it, you know, under entertainment or addiction, that you'd rather spend your time on something that's for yourself than just finding out what God's will is for your life. Maybe that word is hidden under depression or hopelessness or unfaithfulness. Maybe you've read the word and you've gone away from the word because you say, Lord, I don't see what you're doing because your word says that you'll, you'll provide for me and protect me. And I don't feel like that's what it is. But that's not, we don't go to feelings. We go to the truth. The truth of God's word is that he is doing those things. He always was and he always will be, no matter what it looks like. God is truthful. And what he says in his word is truth. He will use, if you, if you go back to those names, and I just want to show you that there's something else here. If you go back to those names, you'll find that Josiah's father was Amon and Josiah's grandfather was Manasseh. Those were the two most evil kings that reigned. Those were the ones that shed so much blood that there was blood all over Jerusalem. The, one that, the ones that put their children in the fire and, and practiced witchcraft. But if you read uh, uh, Matthew 1, 1 to 10, in that list of names, in Matthew 1, it says to us, this is the genealogy of who? Of Jesus Christ, the most pure, holy, beautiful man that ever lived, the one that came and he, he hung on a cross for you, the one who saved you, the one who lived a sinless life, the one who, you, you, he died for you. I mean, it makes me, I can cry if I think about what God did for me on that cross, Jesus Christ, the one who didn't sin. And he, this is his family line. And in that family line, we, two, we find two of the most evil people who ever lived. And again, the Bible comes and it says, I've got a message for you. I want to tell you something. Because God will use everything for his glory. And God will use everything to take us to Jesus. He'll use the most evil people to take us to Jesus. I and mean, if we look at what's happening in our country and in, in the world, and we look and we go, where is God? Why is he doing nothing? He is, he always is, and he always will be, because he will use everything for his glory, and that is the truth. We are so blessed. I hope that you know that in your hands you have the most powerful words that were ever written, and what he tells us to do is take it up. You have to read this word. Go find that story. Go look at those names and see what God speaks to you. You know, when I was... Uh, Younger, I was, uh, I was in the Air Force. I spent three years in the Air Force, and actually I was a weapons trainer, um, a weapons instructor, and I taught men and women how to use weapons. Um, and you'll be amazed. You know, people arrive, and they've seen movies with weapons in, and they've seen comics with weapons in, but when somebody gets a weapon and they haven't been trained, it's pretty useless in their hands. I mean, I remember the young guys, they would come and we'd give them a hand grenade. And, and I, I promise you, a guy will take the hand grenade, he'll pull the pin and lob the pin. And he's standing there with the hand grenade in his hand, and you'll say, uh, Chappie, what's in your hand? <laughs> Changes everything. A weapon that you don't know how to use is useless. It's pointless. And it's the same with the sword of the Spirit. We know that it's a weapon, but we've got to know how to use it. We've got to use this weapon. We've got to know how to read the Bible. And so the Holy Spirit can help us. The Holy Spirit will, will read the Bible as we read the Bible. But this is a relationship. The Bible tells us over and over again that we have to walk in the Spirit. We have to take it up. We have to read it. As we read it, God will read it with us, and he'll reveal things to us. And maybe you've never read the Bible before, and, uh, or maybe you've tried, and it's daunting. But I just want to give you a practical tip today. The Bible is a library. It's, it's, a, it's a collection of books that were written specifically as books. 
And you wouldn't walk into a library and go to your book and pull it out and take a verse and then put the book back and then go to another book and take it out and look at a verse and put it back again. You would take a book. And so, and so I want to encourage you to take a book. Take a book and read it from the beginning to the end and see what you think about as you read that book. Read the whole book front to back. Pray about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you things. Once you've read it from front, front to back, think about it in context. The Bible is written in context. There's things that the writer would write specifically to the people that he's writing to. It gives us, it unlocks something. It shows us something when we understand the context. So you ask yourself, you know, who wrote this book? Who were they writing to? When did they write this book? Because that context will tell you about the culture of the time. It will tell you the cultural things that you can leave behind and the cultural things you must take with you. It will tell you the laws you can leave behind and the laws you must take with you. You need to know the context. You need to know your weapon. So I want to challenge you. Pick a book right now. One of the courses that we run uh, in prison is called Unlocking the Bible. You can go get that book uh, anywhere uh, uh, online at a bookstore. It's, called, it's by David Pawson. It's called Unlocking the Bible. And what that book does is it gives you the context. It tells you the historical context, the geographical context, the cultural context. And once you see all these things, in fact, if you pick the book of Ephesians and you go look at what it says in Unlocking the Bible, suddenly as you read that book, it will start to make sense because you'll see how it was intended to be read. You need to have context. I want to challenge you, pick a book right now, even if that book is Ephesians, one that we've been reading, and for the next month, read that book, start to finish, chew on that word. You know, the word of God, it's like uh, if you eat biltong, you don't take a piece of biltong, put it in your mouth and go, you know, you still, you'll be full, but you didn't taste anything. You've got to chew on this word. You've got to think about what God's speaking to you. You've got to look at the words. Why did he use those words at that time? And, this, and why is he speaking to me now about that thing? Go read it, and then I want to encourage you. Once you've done that, come back and give a testimony. Tell us what God did as you read his word, because I'm going to tell you something. Something's going to happen. He's going to reveal something to you as you do that. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be hungry? Do you want to be thirsty? I'm going to end with this. Uh, when I say end, that's the next 40 minutes. Um, I want us to remember today that this word of God is all about Jesus. This whole book is about Jesus. You know, when I was born again, the Lord encouraged me. I, I felt him whisper in my ear, and he said to me, Dennis, go and find Jesus in the Bible. And, uh, and so I started doing that. I started looking for Jesus from the front to the back, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I got books like Christ in all the scriptures. I studied the canon of scripture. I went to see, I got a Louis Giglio Bible called the Jesus Bible. I didn't know that you had to call it the Jesus Bible. I thought it was the Jesus Bible. But then I started highlighting everywhere that there was a mention of Jesus, where there was a reference to Jesus, where there's a shadow of Jesus, a foreshadow of Jesus. And guess what I found as I looked through that book? I found Jesus. From the beginning to the end was Jesus because the book is all about Jesus. The whole book is about Jesus. The God's whole story is about Jesus. God's whole plan is about Jesus. God's whole plan for your life is about Jesus because he's going to use everything to take you to Jesus. You know, and as I, as I read the Bible, as I was looking for, for Jesus in the Bible, and I started in Genesis 1. So we're going to start in Genesis 1 and then get all the way to Revelation 22. Um, have you got some time, eh? You didn't have anything else to do today. I read the words in the beginning, and in the beginning, I don't know if you know, but our Bibles are, are, are translations, and so the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and so in the beginning is one word, it's in beginning, and, and as you look at that word, you'll see Hebrew is an amazing language, uh, uh, it's got an alphabet, I'll teach you some Hebrew quickly, the alphabet in Hebrew, this is going to blow your mind, is Aleph Bet, <laughs> try and remember that. Is an alphabet, so there's letters, and every letter's got a number, and every, and every letter's got a little picture. And so if you take that word, in beginning, the, the Hebrew word for it, and I'll, and I'll try to say it properly, is berashit. And it's made up of six letters, and those six letters are bet, resh, aleph, shin, yod, tav, berashit, six letters. And if you see those six letters, you can put them up. And if you see the little pictures for each of those six letters, you'll see what God is putting into that first word in beginning. The first one, bet, is a house or a tent. 
The second one is resh, which is a head. You know, if you take bet and resh and you put them together, they make a word, and that word is bar. And bar means son, the son of. Who's the first person that God tells us about in his word is Jesus. The first person that he speaks about is the son, his son, Jesus, because Jesus is from the beginning to the end. And he tells us that Jesus is the head of his house. And then he says to us, let's look at the rest of the word quickly. He says, Aleph is God. It's an ox's head. It, it represents power or God. Shin is teeth. It means to, des to destroy. Yud is an open hand, a closed hand. Sorry. And it means my work. And Yud, a, a Tav is a cross. It's two sticks that are put across. And I want to read that to you. You can get whatever you want from that first word in our Bible. You can take whatever you want from it. But let me tell you what it says. It says, the head of the house, who is my son, Jesus, I, God, will destroy him on the cross by my own hand. In the first word, he tells us the most important person in this book is Jesus Christ. And he tells us in the first word what his plan was from the beginning. He puts the gospel as a hidden message in the first word of the Bible. If you think that God, you know, didn't have a plan, he didn't know what was going on, that he's waiting for you just to make things right, I want you to know that he, he wrote this, he put this in thousands of years before Jesus was born. He knew the plan, he knows your life, he knows the plan, he knows what you're doing, and he knows what he's going to do about it. God is sovereign and in control, and we find him in beginning, better sheet, in the beginning. This is Jesus from the beginning to the end. Everything in this book is Jesus. As we take up the sword of the Spirit, we take up Jesus. When Paul tells us, put on the full armor of God, just think about the things that he tells us to do. He says, put on truth, Jesus is truth. Put on righteousness, Jesus is righteousness. Put on the gospel of peace. Jesus is the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith. Jesus is the shield. Take up salvation. Jesus is salvation. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Who's the word of God? The word of God is Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he came and he dwelt amongst us. And so what is he saying? Put on the full armor of God. Everything in the Bible points to Jesus, and everything that Paul tells us is about Jesus. And when he says, put on the full armor, he says, put on Jesus. As you go into the spiritual battle, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says to us in, in Romans 13, 11, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on all day and every day. You know, as we finish this uh, series on the armor of God, it's been an amazing series. Uh, I'm so grateful for every person who shared with us on, on the parts of the armor, on the unseen battle, the things that going, that's going on in our lives that often we, 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 we're not conscious of. Um, I just want to remind you that, that what Paul is telling us to do, we have to keep our eyes open. We have to know that there's an enemy. We have to see what he's doing in our lives. We have to see the, the puppies for what they are that they are the monsters that came to destroy us. And we need to pray that, that, that we would be set free. And we are set free not when we have a Bible, not when the Bible's sitting on the shelf. We, we are set free when we read the Bible and we do what the Bible tells us to do. It is no good having a Bible. You have to read it and you have to do what it says. We have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. As we think about the spiritual warfare, we have to remember that our focus is not on evil. Our focus is on the cross. Our focus is on Jesus. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. It's all about Jesus. Our focus is on Jesus. Look to him. Pursue him. And I want to ask, just as I, as I really do finish now, um, can I pray for you? You know, as that man prayed for me for a hunger and a thirst, I want to I pray for you. And I want to just remind you, you know, as my sister found a hidden message from our little brother, there's a hidden message here for you. And all that God wants you to do is spend your time going and finding and looking and reading and seeking out Jesus, pursuing him in this word, opening this word, reading this word. And I just want to encourage you. There's no excuse. Go and pick it up and read it. You have it. We are blessed to have this book and to have this Bible. And as we, as we uh, think about that, let me tell you some of the, the hidden messages. Close your eyes, bow your heads. I'm going to pray for you. Father, we just, we're so grateful for your word. 
Uh, we're so grateful for your presence, Lord, but we know that in your word that you've given us hidden messages, that you speak to us, Lord, that you, all you're asking is that we would open them up, Lord. Lord, I pray today that you would just put a hunger and a thirst in our hearts for you, Lord Jesus, that you would put a hunger and a thirst in our, in our hearts for, for this word of yours that leads us to Jesus. Father, I pray that you would show us again today that everything leads to Jesus, that Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Father, I'm reminded from the scripture today, and as I read these things, I just pray that you would hear them in your heart, that you would take them into your heart, that God knows you, He loves you, He sees you, He values you, He wants you, He protects you. God is providing for you. He'll never leave you. He'll comfort you. He'll heal you. The, the word tells us that he'll renew your strength. Maybe you're tired. It says, I will renew their strength. They'll run. They won't be weary. They'll walk and they will not faint. He'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you a future and a hope. He'll make your path straight. He'll give you rest. He'll supply every need. He'll strengthen you. He'll help you. He tells you that you don't have to be afraid for He is with you. He tells you that you don't have to want for anything because He provides everything, that He will restore your soul. He says that when you pass through the waters, He'll be with you. He says that you don't have to be in fear or in dread of the people that are in your life that are trying to push you down and keep you down because He is your God and He goes with you. He tells us that He has a covenant with us and, and, and in that covenant, it's for you and your family. That he's promised us all these things and he is doing all these things because he is faithful when we are faithless. And God is a faithful God who keeps the covenant. For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. My covenant of peace shall not be removed. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. I'll remove the heart of stone from you and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. Father, I'm so, I'm so grateful that, you know, we can't do these things, that we don't have the power within ourselves, but that we can stand firm in your mighty power, that you gave us the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that we could do things that were, that were above anything that even you did, Jesus, that we have all of that strength and that power and that might within us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit that under these words we would remember that whatever was spoken is going to accomplish what it, was, what it set out to do. And these words are true and they speak into our hearts, Lord. Father, would you, would you remind us, Lord, that, that we are allowing things into our lives that we, we think are puppies, Lord. Would, would you just, would you even now, Lord, in this time, under the, under the guidance and the light of the Holy Spirit, would you show us again those things that we are allowing into our lives that the devil has sent to destroy us, to, to kill us, Lord? Let us see them for what they are. Holy Spirit, bring light into the hearts of every person under this word, Lord. Speak to them now in the name of Jesus. Speak to them about those things, Lord, that they would take their hands off them and that they would stop flirting with them because these things have come to destroy. But Jesus, you are better. Jesus, you are more. Jesus, you are mighty. We thank you for the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Lord, I just pray that you would seal this Word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.